Welcome to a new year of listening and learning. We're heading into 2023 discussing the mind-bending, fascinating field of neuromorphic engineering. It's next-level artificial intelligence developing computer systems that work like the human brain. How can a computer think like a person? Plenty of food for thought next on this first Technology Today episode of 2023. We live with technology, science, engineering, and the results of innovative research every day. Now, let's understand it better. You're listening to the Technology Today podcast presented by Southwest Research Institute. From deep sea to deep space, we develop solutions to benefit humankind. Transcript and photos for this episode and all episodes are available at podcast.swri.org. Share the podcast and hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to our first Technology Today episode of the new year. I'm Lisa Pena. We begin 2023 with a brain teasing topic as we learn about SWRI's new neuromorphic engineering capabilities. We're talking about building biologically inspired technology, computer systems that behave like the human brain. And these systems can be used in multiple industries for multiple purposes, including aerospace, space science, autonomous driving, and even wearable smart devices like your watch. Our guest today is neuromorphic engineering expert and SWRI staff engineer, Dr. Stephen Harbour, who is leading SWRI's neuromorphic research. Welcome and thank you for being here, Steve. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. It's it's an honor and a privilege to be able to be on uh, your podcast. Well, this is such an exciting topic, a fascinating topic to launch the year with. So to start this discussion, let's define neuromorphic engineering. What is it? How do you define it? Certainly. Uh, Well, neuromorphic engineering is a relatively young field that attempts to build both hardware and software realizations of biologically realistic models of the brain, our neurons and neural systems, using electronic circuits algorithms, specifically something called SNNs, which we'll describe uh, a little bit later, um, implemented in very large scale integration technology. While originally focusing on models implemented using mainly analog circuits, the field has grown and expanded to include the modeling of neural processing systems that incorporate the computational role of the brain that model learning and cognitive processes and that implement large distributed spiking neural networks using a variety of design techniques and technologies. This emerging field is characterized by its multidisciplinary nature and is focused on the physics and math of computation, cell biology, theoretical neuroscience, artificial intelligence and machine learning, device physics, electrical engineering, and computer and data science. Okay, so essentially you are building networks, building technology to emulate some of the functions of the human brain. So what is superior about our brains? Why do we want to create technology that functions like the human brain? Certainly. Uh, The human brain is far superior to the ordinary computer, driven by what's called Van Neumann architecture processors, which is what we use today. All our computers use Van Neumann architecture processors today, uh, and our brain is far superior to those processors. CPUs and GPUs, uh, central processing units and graphical processing units, are what you'll find in our computers and also computing systems and and, uh, automobiles, uh, self-driving automobiles, aerospace, space, that's our our current bread and butter today. And our brain is far better than they are. Um, Now, I know that, you know, those computers, when combined with a lot of GPUs, they can compute numbers fast. Uh, But what they're not good at is uh, our brain is better at reasoning, interpreting the outside world, coming up with new ideas and dealing with the unexpected query. The brain is capable of imagination, for example. Uh, The human brain only uses 20 watts of power, which is less than a light bulb, and it has 100 billion neurons. Our memory is co-located with and throughout our brain, uh, where it's not on the current Van Neumann architecture that we use. Our cognition uses parallel computing. Our brains can learn on the fly. Current computers cannot do that. Uh, Our brains use asynchronous event-based spikes uh, with sparse information. Our brains are better at learning new things and then changing as required in a new environment. 
Uh, therefore, in order to improve how our computers currently operate, uh, which they pretty much peaked, so to speak, uh, we need to turn to the human brain as our model and guide and create technology that functions like the human brain. So the brain is in so many ways superior to the computer systems we're currently using. It's really fascinating. I keep using that, coming back to that word, but it really is that you think of a computer kind of, you know, being able to do it all, but it still can't accomplish what our brains accomplish and in such an efficient manner. So one of the main components that you are working on building um, are spiking neural networks that perform uh, like the brain. Spiking neural networks, you mentioned that term a while right. ago. So let's yes. talk about that. What are SNNs, spiking neural networks? Certainly, certainly. So they are what we call in the field as third generation artificial intelligence and machine learning networks. We'll start with that. Um, SNNs mimic human brain activity and can be accomplished in software or hardware or both at the same time. They mimic information in the brain that are action potentials, neuron spikes, which may be grouped into spike trains or even coordinated waves of brain activity between neurons through synapse. Those are connections. These are an effect uh, are an effect of an ion reaction caused by a thought or thoughts or vice versa. So uh, we have this electri electrical activity occurring in our brain um, and they happen in spikes. Uh, when a, a voltage threshold is crossed within a cell, uh, then a voltage spike occurs and then that message, if you will, is transferred to the next neuron, uh, so on and so forth. And so we then um, emulate that um, either electronically and or through software or both. Um, so our electrical circuits communicate like the human brain. So that message being transferred from neuron to neuron, there's a spike there, which is what gives us the name. That's correct. That is correct. Um, and the next neuron um, either impedes that spike based on what it is, what that message is, if you will, or it continues it along to the next neuron and so on and so forth. Uh, there's something that occurs in the brain called long-term potentiation. And if a spike is generated from one neuron uh, and is passed to another neuron, if that spike is repeated relatively quickly, it reinforces uh, that information. It also strengthens the connection uh, between the two neurons, um, and I'm sure everyone has heard of uh, neurons that, that fire together, wire together. Well, actually, a memory is formed that way in the brain. That's how we form memories. Um, and so we then emulate that in the computing system to form memories on the same processor, which is completely different than how we do it today. Long-term depression controls that um, so you don't have you, you don't want your mind to go um, you know with several spikes and and then you you would have overriding of memory occur and so to avoid that another process called long-term depression occurs in our brain and to control how memories are formed um, and we can emulate that in the computer as well so the spiking neural network, what is better about that system versus what we currently have in a computer? I know you mentioned there's memory there. I mean, does the computer actually remember past experiences, so to speak? Yes, it does. So uh, currently today with the current computer architecture that we use today um, uh, with a processor, uh, the memory is off chip, it's off the processor. So there are devices, other devices where the memory is stored um, and or manipulated. So the processor has to take the information off board of the chip and save it to a memory device and then also retrieve it when necessary. Well, that takes extra time. Even though things are happening very fast to computers, um, that there's a distance involved there uh, and also a bottleneck. So there's one pathway to that memory device going and coming and the traffic has to be controlled. So that slows things down. It also eats up a lot of extra energy that's not necessary to go back and forth. Um, whereas when it's on the processor, the memory is actually on the processor through this um, similarity to a long-term potentiation, long-term depression uh, methodology, 
um, it then is stored actually on the processor and remembered on the processor, which makes retrievable, retrieving it near, near simultaneous um, as writing the memory, if you will, if you look at it from a writing perspective. Um, the, the spike and why our brains are far better at being able to um, comprehend something quicker or make an inference faster is that um, the, the, the spikes um, can be more sparse than a continuous type data information. So we can use less information and recognize something. A perfect example um, is, uh, let's say uh, you were going to have a drone um, at, at, a, um, at a ranch to fly and look for coyotes to alert um, um, the ranch, the rancher or farmer of, of that ranch. Um, you'd have to train traditionally today with first and second generation AIML. You'd have to train it with several images of, of, of various coyotes, you know, a thousand plus images for it to be accurate enough to be able to identify a coyote. Whereas as a human, um, um, we clearly uh, have some experience with animals. However, you don't have to show us a thousand pictures of a coyote. You can show us one or two pictures of a coyote. And we've got it. We know that's a coyote and we'll recognize that coyote rather quickly, much better than a computer will. And it goes back to um, the spikes and the um, sparsity of events that we need, all we need to understand what that is. And the memory is, is very rapidly processed. Okay. So we're talking about retaining memory. Um, so when we say we're building computers to be like the human brain, how far does this go? Is this a processing function only? I guess, what are the limits here? Are we anywhere near like a computer having original thoughts or feelings? Certainly, certainly. Very, very good question and something that we need to be very aware of uh, ethically as we proceed. So, yeah, this is an architecture that we can go very far in um, in improving the, the uh, computer's ability to think deeper um, and so we have to be very careful with that. Uh, however, um, it's, it's, uh, again, we're, we're modeling the computer, um, uh, to be like the brain, human brain and nervous system. Uh, and, and that focuses around silicon, right? Uh, you know, uh, person made hardware, software, um, and, and, uh, it performs far better than traditional Van Neumann systems do. Um, with less power and they, they perform better, uh, but it's still just artificial intelligence. Um, it's not artificial general intelligence, uh, which is what you're referring to there a little bit. And the system's not self-aware. So um, these uh, neuromorphic processors don't have the ability um, to be self-aware. Um, so uh, there shouldn't be any concerns with that kind of stuff occurring. So it sounds silly, right? But I think it's important to get that message out there because when we're talking about building something like the human brain, well, we want to know how how much like the brain is it. Right. So good right. to know, not self-aware. Um, so let's talk about how long we've been uh, working on these types of technologies. Uh, SWRI, um, this is sort of a recent development for us. Uh, so tell us about how long we've been working on neuromorphic solutions and what neuromorphic technology is the Institute currently working on? I know with our defense and intelligence work, we can't always disclose projects, but what can you talk about today? Certainly, absolutely. So um, since about uh, 2020, um, Southwest Research Institute, um, we've been involved in fundamental, basic, and applied research when it comes to neuromorphic neuromorphics. Um, and I've got to I've got to give a shout out to um, three gentlemen um, that I think are visionaries, and uh, that would be Chris Camargo, Neil Smith, and Walt Downing. Uh, they had the vision. Um, to approve and fund the IRs and PDIRs uh, for neuromorphic uh, research, um, which is now growing into prototypes um, and ultimately products. Um, and so we've begun uh, and are furthering that research in defense and intelligence solutions first. Um, it's it's going to grow elsewhere. It, it has to. Um, projects currently, uh, like Neuromorphic Pilot, uh, Amelia aircraft and drone mission computers and loyal wingmen. So, um, 
Um, they're not self-aware. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll restate that. But this enables, yeah, well, this enables it's us. <laughs> yeah, it's very important. Very important. This enables us, though, uh, to get to uh, the next level of AI ML, and uh, we can have systems that, for example, can behave more like the human pilot uh, and start to make some decisions. So, um, you know, that's that enables us to do that. Uh, and so it's pretty neat to be able to have, you know, a pilot um, that might be a, your loyal wingman, but it may be a neuromorphic system that's over there flying next to you. Um, however, I will also say that uh, this will be what's called pilot on the loop. Uh, which is a little bit different than pilot in the loop, but pilot on the loop can always take over or take control of the neuromorphic system. Um, so they're not going to be out there flying, you know, on their own, <laughs> doing their own thing. There's always going to be a human that can uh, take over control of, of that system. Um, and so uh, recent discoveries made through our research that's part of um, what we're talking about as far as prototypes and products is that we've done several, several investigative type testing uh, with these different uh, prototype devices. And, um, and we've discovered that this technology neuromorphics implements uh, low swap. Uh, low swap is um, low size, weight, and power uh, while outperforming <clears throat> the GPU and CPU in results. It's pretty amazing. Um, you know, for example, um, currently we have what I, I will call GPU farms, server farms out there um, to do processing, uh, maybe even machine learning processing. And they use simply way too much power. They consume way too much power. In fact, um, they can um, um, equivalently produce as much CO2 in two weeks as 1,300 cars. And most folks don't realize that. Um, and so we, um, it's not very wise to continue doing more GPU, GPU, GPU. We're gonna have to uh, look to this alternative. And so the question could be, well, we do that. Uh, um, is this neuromorphic processor going to perform well enough? Well, as I've been saying earlier, it performs better. Um, and so it does. Um, when you compare the neuromorphic processor to the Van Neumann architectures of GPU and CPUs, uh, they do perform far better. Um, they 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 train faster in a AI ML type environment. Um, they need less epics to train. Um, they uh, and that's another way they consume less energy. Um, they also arrive at inference much faster, which is a performance measurement, and they're more accurate than the CPU and GPU. So they they perform better and they do it for less power, uh, like our brains. You know, we just need four bananas a day for our brain, and we're good to go. But the computers don't accept bananas. <laughs> no, no, that's a good point. Yeah, no, we, okay. we, haven't, we haven't imitated that one yet, no. All right, so we're looking at better processing, um, more accuracy, um, less energy usage, so all around, it sounds like the neuromorphic processors are outperforming the traditional processors. Um, and so you and I wanted to get a little bit more into the the technology. You mentioned um, the pilot, the neuromorphic pilot, um, right. Amelia. Um, how soon until? Well, first of all, we we're kind of a, there are already systems that can fly planes, correct? True. But this is. But this is a little bit different and has the, um, as we mentioned, some of the better components of, of neuromorphic processing. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, um, absolutely. And how absolutely. soon could we see it in use? Uh, okay, so um, basically, yes, we've had, uh, say, we'll say autopilots, right, uh, on aircraft for a very long time. Um, I used to I probably have it memorized what year the autopilot started. I, I, it's probably, it goes back a long, long time. Um, but nonetheless, that's automation. It's not artificial intelligence. Um, and so uh, we even today are starting to use, um, you know, Gen 1, Gen 2 AI ML to do some autopilot flying and some lower level decision making. But uh, if you want to get to that 
um, approaching human level type thinking and decision making. Uh, neuromorphics um, is where you need to go. Um, that gives you that ability you didn't have before. And so literally, um, um, you know, the, the system can behave more closely to um, the actual pilot. Um, and this includes decision making, you know, what should I do next? Um, and that's um, the advantage you get with the neuromorphic technology, along with low swap, you get that ability as well. Um, and so we're working on that right now. Uh, I think uh, you could see this uh, pretty rapidly anywhere between uh, one year from now um, to no further out than a couple of years away uh, using that um, in the way that we're planning to use it. Okay, so we have this was a kind of an in depth discussion about how the aerospace industry could use neuromorphic technology. Uh, but there are other examples, other industries that could benefit from this type of technology. Can you tell us a little bit more about other industries and other uses for neuromorphic technology? Absolutely, absolutely. So, as you know, at SWRI, we're using this currently in aerospace for defense. Uh, in Division 16, uh, neuromorphic systems, again, provide low swap. Um, and so, um, you know, again, we talked about the inference time being much quicker and the accuracy being much better and 10, 20, 30 times less power than other processors. So they're perfect for air transportation and defense, but also for health wearables. So wearable devices, um, watches that can sense the various health of a person and other type devices that can be worn. Um, and, and this can be done um, on the edge per se. And I'll describe what that is. So currently I've just started uh, research with Prativa HeartNet and Division 10 on neuromorphics involving wearable devices. Um, um, uh, and, you know, being able to process it on the spot faster without having to go to the cloud uh, to process the information. That's another thing that neuromorphics does for you. Also space science, avionics uh, for long endurance probe and onboard processing. Um, neuromorphics is, is the place to go to, to, to ensure that happens. Okay, so many up and coming uses for this truly amazing technology. So as I mentioned, this is next level artificial intelligence. So how is it different from the traditional AI we've come to know? Um, it emulates how the human brain interacts with the world to deliver capabilities closer to human cognition. Biologically inspired and plausible artificial spike neural networks is what we call them when we talked about them. These are novel models that simulate natural learning by dynamically remapping neural networks and are used in neuromorphic computing to make decisions in response to learn patterns over time. Neuromorphic processors leverage these asynchronous event-based SNNs to achieve orders of magnitude gains in performance with far less power required over conventional architectures. Um, so yeah, this the, the sky's the limit. I, I, I also see these uh, being, you know, uh, our motto is deep sea to deep space. I see this also in submersibles, submarines and, and ships as well in those various uses. So there really is no limit to how we can apply um, neuromorphic solutions, which is, again, my, my buzzword, my favorite word of the day, fascinating. <laughs> so, um, well, let's talk about, you know, you mentioned this is an emerging field. So what are some of the challenges of being on the ground floor of developing this technology? Certainly, certainly. Uh, so there are, in the very beginning, uh, like when you get started with anything, um, uh, that's difficult uh, and a lot of unknowns. Uh, there were a lot of unknowns um, uh, when first getting started. Um, and there were some, there can be some, you know, uh, false starts and stumbles. Um, and some people uh, you know, look at this and go, especially when I started doing research in this area, that hey this is cr this is crazy um uh and you just just have to stick with it um uh, i started early research in the very beginning probably in 2014 and then obviously continued that um 
uh, with Southwest Research in 2020, and we have come a long way. It's it's a, it's a long road, but it's very important. And any time that you you do research, I think that's worth doing. Um, it's not going to be easy. Uh, there's going to be an element of of folks that uh, think that maybe that's a little bit kooky. Um, but you just keep going and you may find out that, you know, that path is leading you down the wrong way. You could try a different path, um, and continue on. And you may find out that it's going to be a dead end, but clearly this is, is, uh, I think we're past those, uh, wrong turns and dead ends and, and we're going the, we're going down the right path. All right. And if you are new to this topic, as you said, some might find it kooky. It sounds slightly scary, you know, computers with human minds, you know, it sounds a little bit like a, a sci-fi movie, but again, that's not really what we're talking about here. Right, and right. We've, we've reviewed this through this entire conversation, but I think it's worth repeating. Can you tell us about the benefits of engineering technology to emulate the brain? Why push forward? Certainly, absolutely. So this shouldn't be scary. It's it's not meant to be scary. Um, uh, this is not going to replace the human mind, uh, but it will help humans and society. So from robotics um, and artificial limbs to possible brain computer interaction to help people with various disabilities or to perform medical treatments. So uh, view this as a good thing. Uh, not not a bad thing. Uh, and these aren't, uh, you know, when you think of all the sci-fi movies, that's not what this is. It's not science fiction. Um, it just um, seemed uh, rather um, a good idea if you want to make computers better. Uh, the human brain does a pretty good job of it, um, uh, a very good job of it. Let's emulate the human brain to get to the next level, the next generation. Uh, and that's what we've done. Uh, but clearly, these are not, uh, you know, we have not built a human brain. Uh, and, and, you know, when we talk about, say, a million neurons on a neuromorphic processor, that may seem impressive, and it is for, for today's technology, but our human brain has 100 billion neurons. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think we're, I think we're uh, in, in good shape. And this is meant to help humans not uh, take over the world. So that's great that you pointed out that one day this could be used in medical treatments. Could you walk us through a, a medical treatment scenario for neuromorphic engineering? In severe PTSD cases, the hippocamp hippocampus actually shrinks. Um, that's where a lot of our learning occurs and our neurogenesis occurs. And so it actually has, um, you know, a medical effect, uh, you know, both physiologically and psychologically. And so... If there, you know, if there's a way to, um, you know, utilize a neuromorphic processor uh, at some degree uh, to aid with that with the human, um, either through computerized cognitive training or actually a little bit more evasive, uh, it might be able to help that situation. Or someone who has brain damage in an automobile accident or um, some kind of cognitive disability, there might be a way to interface the neuromorphic processor with the person to actually help them. Um, so I do think, uh, and so yeah, I do think that's a, a follow on research area that if I was, you know, I would love to also pursue. So I do think this, whereas traditional processors really couldn't do that. They just weren't so structured at all. Go ahead. Something like a device to pick up where um, the mental disability leaves off uh, exactly. to, to help a person make decisions. Exactly yeah, right. So so that's really interesting. Does not exist currently, but that's that's sort of your vision. That's one of right. your many visions for this technology sure. of sure. what it be. Right. So, you know, as you advance this technology, as we said, there are uh, some critics. So, any pushback? Are you experiencing that? And what do you say to critics of this type of work? Certainly. So at first, there were a lot of critics. So, you know, I remember, you know, very, you know, when I talk about 2014, very, very extremely fundamental early stages, right? Um, and, and you're right, a lot of folks were like, you're crazy. 
um, uh, and then, you know, 2016, and then, you know, certainly, um, you know, as it evolves, uh, a few more acceptors uh, as things are proven more in the laboratory. Um, and then, you know, 2020, again, I go back to, um, you know, those uh, gentlemen uh, mentioned earlier, um, you know, there was a lot of folks that I talked to at first um, that, you know, again, get out of here. Um, but then they saw the possibilities and were willing to take a small risk and go further with it. Uh, and so from that, you know, proofs in the pudding. So as you do more experimentation, uh, the critics start to melt away. Um, and uh, it gets brought out you know, by the scientific work that we do. Uh, I call them naysayers, but they'll start to uh, understand um, and, and, and it goes away. So it kind of occurs naturally. It's just part of research. Um, there'll always be folks that uh, will, you know, not be for this probably, but I think that the results are going to show time and time again that it's just too good of a, of, of a, at some point product products that folks will accept it. Uh, and so, um, that, that's how, that's how, that's what I found. So you obviously have a lot of enthusiasm for this field as you push forward and push past the critics, and you've been doing it for many years now. So what do you enjoy about this field? Why do you do it? What's your motivation? Absolutely, certainly. So uh, I find uh, it to be absolutely fascinating, um, you know, in general to perform scientific inquiry and discovery, um, especially in the field of neuromorphics. Um, this is truly a disruptive technology. Um, I know it's going to help humans, the environment, and also the defense of this great nation, and we need that. Also, it's right up my alley. Uh, being both that I'm an electrical engineer and a neuroscientist, and pretty much this technology combines both of those fields. So that was, uh, uh, you know, was a perfect fit for me. All amazing reasons. Um, disruptive technology that is, as you said, it uses less energy, so it's going to help the environment, uh, help, is going to help humans and lead to much needed solutions for our defense and intelligence. You know, I have to ask, how does that happen? How does one become an electrical engineer and a neuroscientist? Did you see this field coming to be? Uh, how did you merge both of those fields for yourself? How did you make that decision? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, yeah, I think that I had, um, you know, having an electrical engineering background, um, um, and it was, uh, I, I had the desire to, uh, continue further and and do the PhD. Um, I uh, had done a lot of research before entering the entering any kind of PhD, applying to any kind of PhD program. And yes, I was doing some reading on uh, neuromorphic type stuff, um, and it seemed like a very good thing to look into. Uh, you know, emulating the human brain. Uh, you know, that's uh, seemed like to me. Uh, a good pathway to take. Well, there's some skill sets I had to have being a, being a double E, uh, you know, the human brain, um, you know, neuroscience, uh, that seems to be kind of an odd match. Um, but actually, uh, it's not. Um, and so um, it's a good combination to have to go in this type of research. Uh, to get that PhD, for example, the way I did it in, in neuroscience. Um, and my, my neuroscience is uh, uh, in uh, something called two, two different type of neurosciences, computational neuroscience, um, which involves a lot of math and, and, and theoretical type um, stuff. Um, but then also uh, I included biological neuroscience, which is actually how our brains exactly function on, on a biological level um, and being neuroscience is mixed with um, of course, psychology as well, how, you know, our, our, our mind and how we think as well to, as how we're biologically put together. Um, and so that seemed like the right thing to do. Um, and so I started doing research in neuromorphics that way. And that seemed like to be a real good degree combination. And I had seen that others in the field had also gone on that pathway. Uh, and so that's why I chose it. I know you have, you've mentioned a few of, of your plans already, uh, and you have quite a few 
Uh, but what do you see for the future of this technology? Will it be everywhere? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I think in five to 10 years, uh, we're going to see neuromorphic processors uh, to some degree in our home uh, personal computers. Uh, we're going to see them in our cars, um, especially cars that are purely electric and need every bit of energy they can have um, saved up in that battery and not expended on GPU systems. Um, and we're going to see it in non-electric cars. Uh, it's perfect for autonomous driving. Uh, we're going to see it in our airplanes, um, in our space, uh, in you know outer space, um, on our ships, uh, in our subs. Uh, along with those wearable and smart devices um, and and also in the medical arena as well. Uh, it will change the way we live for the better. All right. So essentially, we could see neuromorphic technology just about everywhere. And I really enjoyed this look ahead. I love letting our listeners get a glimpse of what our engineers and scientists are working on and, and giving them that heads up that little preview of what's to come. So thank you for such, again, fascinating information. Just the best word for everything we've learned today. The neuromorphic field is, is booming. And, you know, thank you for giving us insight on, on what you're working on and, and what's next. Uh, absolutely. And I want to thank um, um, y'all. Uh, I want to thank, uh, and, you know, your whole crew, Lisa, and what you're doing. So, you know, the word can get out. And I also want to give a huge shout out to Southwest Research Institute for enabling this research to occur, to to have the vision, uh, to kind of, kind of, you know, go where the, the, you know, the water's kind of unknown, but willing to take a, a chance based on the, uh, the benefits, the potential benefits. And now that we find they are the real benefits, um, it's, 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 uh, uh, I'm going to give it all, all due to Southwest Research Institute. It's a great place to work. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't, it's just wonderful. And thank you to our listeners for learning along with us today. You can hear all of our Technology Today episodes and see photos and complete transcripts at podcast.swri.org. Remember to share our podcast and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to see what else we're up to? Connect with Southwest Research Institute on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Check out the Technology Today magazine at technologytoday.swri.org. And now is a great time to become an SWRI Problem Solver, visit our career page at swri.jobs. Ian McKinney and Brian Ortiz are the podcast audio engineers and editors. I am producer and host Lisa Pena. Thanks for listening. 